Hey everyone, welcome to this week's episode of the Live Support Ops Hangout. I'm your host, Chase Clements. This week, the entire cast is back for the first time in basically forever. I can't recall the last <laughs> time. Um, I'm sure somebody's going to look it up and be like, oh, it was episode such and such that everyone was last <laughs> together, but it felt like forever. Um, so let's just gonna kind of go down the, the row here and make sure that everyone remembers who everyone is. I'm Chase. I'm the host. I work at Base Camp. Uh, and then Carolyn from Buffer who is amazingly back. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. And then next up, we were just joking about it, it's the guy who's got the most facial hair out of any of us, Chase Livingston from Automatic. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. Glad to be back. And last but certainly not least in any stretch of the imagination, Jeff Vincent, who just got married. That's probably the coolest thing, right? It feels pretty cool, yes. It feels great. Glad to be back. Just in case she watches the show, you might want to, you know, like expound on it's great. It's a, ama- it's the best thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> Probably doesn't watch the show. Hundred percent does not watch the show. Boy- <laughs> actively boycotts the show. <laughs> Oh, so that's our crew. It's great to, for everyone to be back. This week, you know, I've been saving this one for a while um, just so, I don't know, just because we're selfish and I wanted this topic for all of us. Um, so we're going to be talking this week about um, how to keep your team happy. You know, lots of, uh, you know, lots of podcasts and blog posts and everything in between talk about how to keep your customers happy, how to keep them loyal, um, you know, how to make sure that they're not churning every month that kind of thing, but we wanted to flip the focus a little bit and talk about the same kind of idea, but for your fellow employees. So how do we keep our teams happy? Uh, You know, through good times, through bad times, through product launches and pivots and whatever else you want to imagine, um, how do you work to make sure that your support team is just as happy as your customers are? Um, So we're going to kick this one off with with Carolyn first, uh, talking about Buffer. Uh, So when it comes to Buffer, how do you, I think the, the first place you want to start is how do you know when someone on your team actually is unhappy? Uh, you are probably the most transparent team out there, so I'm guessing, it, I don't know, is there just some kind of like I'm unhappy button that you can push? <laughs> kind of, yeah. Um, we do um, sort of a peer meeting um, once a week. It's called the Mastermind, and that's... Um, talking a lot about challenges and achievements, and if you're unhappy, that would be the time to bring it up. Um, and there's also a mentor meeting either every week or every other week, um, which we just recently brought back, which I'm really excited about. Um, and that's also a really good place to talk about these things. Um, and, I mean, we work together a lot, but we're not in the same office, so we usually have a sense if somebody's unhappy, but by the time we have that sense, it's usually quite delayed after that person has been feeling unhappy. So um, there is some onus on on the person to sort of be honest about it and be transparent about how they're doing and how they're feeling and what they're thinking about. Yeah, I mean, that's one of those things when it comes to remote working. I'm as guilty as anybody else of this. If I'm having a bad day, if I'm unhappy about something, it's really easy to just kind of like not mention it and then nobody knows about it. Um, so how do you, you know, you talk about the mentors that you're bringing back and the one-on-ones and that kind of thing. Um, are there any specific, like, uh, probing questions or anything that they ask to get that, that person to kind of speak up? Mm, not that I know of. Um, you, you know, I do mostly say, like, how are you doing? But, like, how are you really doing? Like, <laughs> not, like, we'll talk about all the other stuff, but, I mean... I don't know, how are you doing is sort of the most probing question that I usually start with. (laughs) Um, But even just starting a meeting with that, I think, does give somebody an opportunity to go, you know. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, that's one of those where I, so Carolyn grew, I don't know if you grew up in the South, you were in the South for a while like me. Um, It's one of those where whenever you meet somebody in the grocery store, it's like, hey, how's it going? How are you doing? That kind of thing. Um, And that's different from kind of asking it, are you doing okay? Uh, we kind of do the same thing. Uh, I, I've been in one-on-ones before where the conversation might start out, just general platitudes, hey, how you doing? Oh, I'm great. And then it moves into, no, seriously, how's it, like, how thi- How are things really? And that's where you can kind of pull from that. 
so Livingston, uh, Automatic is kind of the same way, all remote, even bigger scale here, so more people in the mix. Um, how do you all make sure that you find out if somebody on your team is unhappy about something? Yeah, so we, um, I guess sort of similarly, we have like check-ins with our, uh, you know, team lead, like one-on-ones, um, you know, every so often to just check in and talk about how things are doing, talk about, um, you know, the the work you've been doing, what you've been working on, um, and, you know, if you're getting like burned out, maybe it's time to do like a rotation on another team or something like that, if you're getting um, uh, burned out with what you're working on. So yeah, just, you know, good communication and and sort of that open line of communication between um, you and your, your team lead or even like Spittle who sort of is the, the happiness lead. Um, we can always, you know, ping him. He's always available to chat about that kind of thing. So, um, you know, it automatically like to say communication is, is oxygen. So um, just making sure that those lines are always there and, and always available that uh, you can, you know, reach out and uh, kind of voice your feelings or uh, frustrations or whatever it might be. So again, so with is, I was trying to think of a good way to phrase this question. So the the responsibility for the person is more <coughs> on the person that's unhappy to speak up about something, and and communicate that to Spittle or any other team lead, right? Yeah, in a lot of ways. But I mean, um, our, our uh, at least my team lead and and other folks that I've worked with have always been really good about. Um, you know, trying to, to notice and pick up on things and, and at least start a conversation. They may not, you know, know the whole situation or have, like, the whole picture because you haven't talked to them about it, but, you know, even them just, like, asking and, and starting that conversation can be really helpful. Um, and so I've, you know, seen that happen in the past or, you know, been a part of that or whatever, and it, it is definitely really helpful when they can pick up on it too. So, Jeff, does any of this get any easier when you're actually in the office with somebody? I mean, are you picking up on... Uh, maybe body language or visual cues or anything at that point? Like, is it just one of these problems that's kind of unique for remote? Um, I don't think it's unique for remote, but I do think the challenge is, is made a little bit easier by being in the same building, right? Because when you are remote, it's very... I, I, I think it's very easy to save your size or save your eye rolls or save your sort of like slump shoulders when you're not on camera or you're not writing an email or a message, like it's very easy to, to sort of like write around that stuff um, when you're remote. When you're in person, there's just maybe it's because we pick very uh, emotive people. I don't know, but it's very hard. What I think that the key here uh, for either remote or in person is just trust and and like teammates feeling like no matter what they have to bring to you it's totally going to be okay and you can talk through it. Um, and that doesn't matter whether you're remote or in person, although it probably gets a little bit easier for us. Uh, having everybody in the same office, I think it's a little bit easier to build that personal connection that makes it so that they could come to you and say, I don't want to do this role anymore, but I still want to be your friend and a valued employee. And you're like, yes, we can figure that out. Um, I wouldn't say I have too, too much experience with anything very serious along that, along those kinds of lines, but there are plenty of times where I'm like, yep, I need to schedule like a little extra session, a little extra time with this person because I can just tell that they're really dragging and they're just not super excited about like, anything that's come up recently or whatever. They're not, they're not participating as much in the ban the general office answer the way they used to. Those are the kind of like slight changes that you might see in someone's behavior that it's like, yeah, hey, I should just check in and make sure that like this lifestyle and this like working environment and that that role in particular is still working out for that person. Yeah, so I want to kind of dive into a little bit on the on the communication aspect because all of us are kind of in the same boat. It has to be communicated one way or the other. Um, you know, either the person that's unhappy has to let the team lead know, or the team lead has to ask the person and figure out if they're unhappy or or whatnot. Um, so let's go with uh, Chase with Automatic, how you, you mentioned you know P2 earlier and then team leads checking in, that kind of thing. Um, what kind of tools are y'all using to make sure that that communication happens, um, that that communication channel is open to, to the team lead at any time? 
Yeah, so I mean the biggest thing we use for that kind of communication is Slack. Um, you know, we all usually have like a you know a regular like DM or a private you know chat with our um, team lead opens so that you know we can ping at any time. Um, and then we also have even for like our team as a whole like a private channel we can use if we just need to like vent, but it's not something that we want like recorded or saved or um, you know out there for somebody to read you know five years from now. Um, those private channels don't get logged or anything like that. So, you know, even if it's just like, hey, I'm really uh, upset about um, this customer. Uh, they really, you know, may, you know, spoke badly of me or, or whatever it might be. You know, we can just vent to each other without having to worry about that getting out somehow. Um, so that's a good way to do it. Um, and then, you know, we... You know, we have, like, metrics around our support uh, and things like that that team leads can look at, like, you know, hey, Chase is only doing, like, five tickets a day. Is he, mm -hmm. you know, something wrong? You know, what's going on? Maybe so, you know, if, if my team lead saw that, maybe he would check in and just say, hey, you know, I, I noticed that um, you don't seem to be, you know, getting as much done. Is there something I can help you with? Uh, you know, is there something going on? you know, otherwise that you need to talk about, you know, that kind of thing. So I think there's a lot of different ways um, to, to sort of have that communication open at all times uh, and to be able to, to chat back and forth when it's necessary. Kelly, what about those, those channels at Buffer? You know, Buffer's, uh, we keep bringing it up because you're such a great example of transparency. So how do you have conversations of this nature when it doesn't really need to be transparent to everybody? Or, or does it? Maybe it does need to be transparent so the whole team can help out the person. Yeah. This is a great one. Um, for transparency, we have... Leo just wrote a blog post about it. I'll send it along for the show notes. Um, we recently moved back toward private feedback. Mm -hmm. um, not praise, obviously, but when there's like you know, a constructive feedback comment. Um, we were doing that publicly for a while, um, and that didn't feel great, so we moved back away from that. Um, yeah, a lot of this happens in private, so the masterminds are not logged anywhere. I mean, we all take notes for ourselves, of course, but um, those are completely private, and so is what's discussed in the, mas in the mentorship sessions, um, the one-to-ones. Um, what we find is that a lot of times people do decide to then the action step from the meeting is to share it, whether it's with another person on the team or several people on the team or even the whole team. Um, you know, sometimes people do feel compelled to, to, to share it more widely, and that's totally encouraged and great. And that goes through all the normal channels, hip chat, email, discourse, whatever. But um, yeah, a lot of it's just talking live over video. So. Um, that is totally private, and all of those things are totally up to the the person to share it or not share. Yeah, I know at Basecamp we had a similar problem like this, where it was, um, even though, and Jason wrote a great article about this in Inc., I think, I'll try to find it, but he talked about how even though you say that your door is always open as a manager, it's not really, because it's kind of tough for people to come to you with anything, regardless of who the person is. Um, so that was one of the reasons why um, Jason had created the Know Your Company app, which is awesome in the way that it works, because every week you're asked a question, and the replies are sent back in, and there's something about being able to sit down, compose an email, compose a message, and then send it in when asked your thoughts about a specific topic or whatnot, rather than having to, you know, not barge into somebody's office, but, you know, go into somebody's office, go into somebody's space and be like, hey, did you know you're really screwing up here and that this would be the better way to do it? Um, so that's one of those things where when you're asking your team, you know, specific questions about are you happy, are you not happy, why are you that way, um, I think having some kind of automated tool that, that does that helps a lot as far as actually getting feedback from somebody, um, whether it be something like Know Your Company or I think 515 or something like that also does a similar 15 thing. 15.5, that's the one I'm thinking of. Um, or if it's regularly scheduled one-on-ones, you know, Carolyn was talking about uh, meeting with the mentors and things every other week or so. Um, I think that, you know, having a tool that makes it consistent and automatic helps a lot too. Um, so now is uh, kind of moving into you found out somebody's unhappy. Now you got to figure out what to do about it. Um, Jeff, we'll start with you on this one. When somebody on your team is unhappy, you know, Jane Doe or whoever, um, and they tell you, you know, I'm unhappy, here's the problem, 
what what it happens then? Like, what kind of process do you have in place for for fixing that? Well, I don't know if there's a really set process. Um, it, it it probably depends on the case a little bit, but in thinking about going through this a few times before, the most important thing, the two most important things for me to like kind of put down on paper in front of me are. Um, what is it that's making them unhappy and like really what is it like like getting down to the bottom of it as far down as you can go with that person to really understand what's causing the problems and then the second one is like our it, it is our core values and and how that informs the way that we operate because there are certain times that um, a teammate and the way we operate just aren't at fundament they're not fundamentally connected Right, their expectations and the way that the company operates are like a bridge that doesn't connect. And if you go ahead, if you trust, try to fix the problem, right? Oh, you know, mm -hmm. whatever you want to, you want a better parking space, like no problem. I'll just fix that problem for you by like switching this around. All you do is like unblock one problem to set them up for running into another problem because at a very basic level, their expectations and what the company is doing are not the same. Right, very similar to someone who says, I really want to work on this thing. Why won't anyone let me work on, on that? I think it's just so important. But if you actually looked at what the company's priorities are, that's not on the list, right? And nobody can make the business case for why that should be on the list. So if you just let that person go on and work on whatever it is that they want, they stop getting feedback from teammates, they stop getting support, they stop getting noticed or mentioned in any of the company public. It's like they don't exist anymore. So just dumping money and you know their salary into something where they're not going to get that much better at it because they're not getting feedback, and also no one's going to recognize them for doing it, which is just super unfortunate. So having those two things in front of you can really inform how much you should invest, like how you should go about approaching fixing the problem, in my opinion. Um, and in some cases, it's like you just need to. Well, in, in many cases, what they're really looking for is like, I would like to be recognized a little bit more. I feel like I'm really working my butt off, and I don't feel like I'm getting the results that I wanted, right? And it's like easy to get frustrated in that. We all work so hard every day, and when you feel like you're going unnoticed, um, that's the worst. Like, I can't imagine anything worse. And it's a great time to step in as a leader and say, well, let's look at all the things you're working on. Right, like it, there may be easy ways to identify things that, as a support person, you're also putting on your plate. You're like, oh, I just I have to keep this on my mind all the time, and I have to like check in on this every day. And it's like, okay, you're just carrying all that stuff around and spending a bunch of time doing stuff that you don't need to be doing, or that you could automate in some fashion, or you know, you could have other teammates to pick you up in that way. It's just a great. I I just think that I put a lot of stock into that conversation of like getting down to brass tacks with the person who's upset and actually spending the time to figure out why they're upset and what we can do to move forward. It, it, it's just, it's just resolves so many, it's like nipped so many things in the bud that I think that if you kind of ignored them or like pushed them off and said like, oh, we have to have further conversations about this, it's just resolved all of them so fast and got people back and excited again. Yeah, I know that whole pushing off thing just, it absolutely never works. I mean, uh, I remember distinctly working in a, in a restaurant where that was kind of the, the GM, the general manager's approach. It was, oh, well, you're unhappy about this now. Let's see if it's still a problem in like four weeks or, or two months or whatever. And surprise, four weeks later, it's still going to be a problem. I mean, that's just one of those things where if, if one of your team members is telling you about a problem they have or something they're unhappy about, it's probably not just a oh, I'm having a bad day, oh, I'm having an off day. It's something that really needs to be dealt with. Um, so, Carolyn, same question over to you. What, what kind of happens when, you know, somebody comes to you and, and says, hey, look, I'm just not happy with X, Y, or Z? Well, yeah, it depends a lot on the context. Um, I loved Jeff's comment um, about the company being aligned. Um, I think... I'm taking a slightly different approach to this answer. Um, when people come to me and tell me that they're unhappy, I, which doesn't happen often, but it has happened and does, um, 
I really love to try and remove obstacles for people, but um, I'm blocked in this area is really different than I'm unhappy. Um, and I'm unhappy, I can't solve. I can't fix I'm unhappy. Um, I can say, I can ask the right questions and learn why and try and help that person think through a path back toward happiness, but um, it's not really something that you can just solve usually. Um, I think in general the person needs to solve it um, and if that person's not happy because you know they want to work on X, Y, or Z, like in Jeff's example, um, which does happen um, as well, then you know you can sort of try and remove obstacles so that that thing is then regarded as important. But um, you know if that's been blocked for whatever reason, you can you can nudge the conversation along as to why and at least figure out whether that's true or not. Like, but unhappy is really strong and you know this may sound insensitive but um, there's two approaches to I'm unhappy. One is okay let's let's figure out what's causing you to be unhappy and what's let's figure out you know what what the, that looks like for you whether that you know whatever path that is to get you back to happy let's let's help you figure out what you need to do to do that um, and the other piece of it is like you know what does unhappy mean like I think that I'm so glad we're talking about this because this is like so on my mind right now um, I was gonna say this is the point where it gets truly meta, and we're like, really? What is ha what is happiness? No, but I really mean that. You know, like I, yeah. I think that hap I love this. Just always makes me think of the, of Jeff's example that one that he always talks about of like some people want to live and breathe and die by their day to day work, and some people want to work from nine to five and like do a really good job and go home and hang out with their dog, um, and so. You know, different. It it depends on what the person's expecting out of, like, why did they think they would be happy at doing what they're doing? Um, and you know, sometimes I think people realize, oh yeah, this is a job. <laughs> like, you know, it is sunshine and rainbows and kittens at Buffer, just like you guys always tease. It totally is. Um, and at the same time, like, you have to be happy within you know, what you think you want out of the job and you have to figure out what that looks like and you have to decide, you know, what it is that makes your heart sing and figure out if you can make that a possibility here. Um, but it's not really something that I can fix. Um, and I think sometimes reminding people what they're grateful about, about or inviting them to explore that is often really helpful as well. Like, oftentimes it's not changing something, it's saying, well, what did you think was going to happen when you like decided to take a job that was remote, like, or you decided to travel, or you decided not to travel, or you decided to take on this role? Like, there's just so much of that. I think is you have to decide if if you're going to be happy or not based on what's around you, um, and I think that's can be done in one-on-ones and can be discussed in masterminds and can be explored in team chats and can be discussed over beers, but um, I think a lot of it kind of has to come from the person. <laughs> Sorry, this is like such a long answer now. Um, but yeah, I think that's my that's my final answer. I don't do she anything, really basically. <laughs> yeah, I basically, I don't do anything. I just ask questions and that's all I can do. Yeah, I think, I mean, so you talk about happiness, and it comes down to, there, for me, and again, like, we're all figuring this out, we're all thinking through it and everything, um, so you've got things that a manager or a team leader or whatever can make a change or, or help do 
something to make that person happier. So if if I went to any of the you know to Carolyn or the guys and uh, you know if I was working with them and I said, hey, look, um, the fact that whenever we launch a feature, whenever we launch a new tool, it always goes out with bugs because we're not doing a Q and uh, Q and A session. We're not doing any kind of design review or anything like that, and that makes me unhappy because for the next like three weeks, I'm gonna get just bug report after bug report after bug report, and I'm going to get complaints and everything else. So that's something that a team lead could fix, right? You, that's something that you can sit down with uh, you know, any of the other teams and say, look, regardless of how perfect you think your code is that you're shipping, there's bugs in there. So we need to take some time to, to like really Q&A it, before, it uh, before we actually ship it. So that that's fixable. If you hire somebody for... The example I always use is if you hire somebody for third shift and they come in and they're really excited about working for Buffer or Automatic or Wistia or whatever and they're all gung-ho about third shift and then six months in they become unhappy because they're working third shift because third shift sucks. We all know that. Um, there's not a lot I can do at that point. I mean, you signed up for it. You knew what was going to happen. You knew what the shift was going to be like. Um, I mean, at that point, it's not like we can move you to a first or second shift because you were hired for that one. Um, so, yeah, you might be unhappy about it, but I don't know. I don't really know. You know what I mean? I mean, there's not really a good way to fix something like that. That's more on the person rather than the manager at that point. Or yeah. I don't know. It's just Jeff just rolling his eyes at this point. No, I don't think... No, it's, <laughs> it's not me rolling my eyes at this point. I, Personally, I don't think you should be. You, we should put anyone in third shift to start with. But um, yeah. I, I guess the the one step that we skipped was how do you set somebody up for success with that stuff? You know what I mean? Like uh, it's totally possible that they were gung ho because they really desperately needed a job, and that they were just like, "Yep, I'm good. No, I just need the job. As long as you're gonna pay me in two weeks, then I'm good to go." And even though they seemed really eager and happy and they were like the dwarves like whistling on their way to the to the <laughs> mine, like if you didn't if you didn't put in the building blocks for making them really happy with their work, then there's no surprise that that came back and happened. I'm not saying that that is the case at all. Like that's you know this is a hundred percent like case by case basis. But I'm just saying that we may. Outside of things that we absolutely shouldn't do, like making someone work overnight, which just sounds terrible, there are also things we should do that kind of like mitigate this from the start. So it's a, so it's like a mix between the, the only thing that I want to add on to what Carolyn said, which I think she would have, except that she's like seems like she might be frustrated about something that's actually happening in real life, <laughs> is um, the shit. She probably would have added like we put in a ton of work when a new buffer person, a new bufferite, bufferian. Buffer. We don't have a good word for it. A buffer. We need when one. A, when a new buffer starts, they put in a ton of work to make sure that that person like has the best chance of being successful. And when then when they come back and they're like, "All your efforts have totally failed me. Like I'm unhappy." It's kind of like, "Oof." Like uh, I'm not really sure what we are going to do here because we really did do our best. Uh, let's dig in and try to find out more. Yeah, and I. To, sorry, sorry. Just make sure I'm saying this right. As opposed to being like, hey, welcome, jump in, there's your job. And then if a few weeks later they come back and they're like, oof, I did not think a churning butter person was going to be this hard. <laughs> Man, is this like canvas <laughs> outfit I have to wear really, it's smelly already. <laughs> how, how did we go from like dwarves or midgets or whatever into the mine and now we're into churning butter? Wait, I, I also want to say I should have maybe clarified because to me, I'm unhappy because there's bugs is like a really different quest problem than like, yeah. I'm unhappy, what are you going to do about it? Like, mm -hmm. I'm unhappy because we have tons of bugs when every three weeks when there's a release is not, that's not I'm unhappy, that's here is a really thoughtful and legitimate improvement we should make. That's a positive. That's like, that's an improvement. I, I don't, I'm sorry. If that's what we were talking about, then I should have gone on a totally different path. I meant more like when when people do come to you and want you to fix it because they're unhappy, but it's not like here's a specific challenge that we as a company are facing or here's a specific challenge that I am facing. It's just like, yeah, I don't know. I'm just not happy. Like, and this, my, like what, what I think I, I don't either know what I want or what I think I want isn't what I have. Like, and 
I don't know. That's I don't think that raising your hand and, and saying here's a problem is ever bad. I think that's really essential. And if that comes across as I'm unhappy, then that's a totally different conversation. Um, that's great, and that's that that is my job. Yeah, I think I screwed that one up just because, like, when I, I don't know, whenever I hear unhappy, I think a lot of times I equate it with, oh, this person's unhappy, they're frustrated, they're angry, or whatever, and it all wraps up into um, a, a problem that they're having with something, with someone or something within the company, if they're unhappy about something like that. that That's fixable. Um, like you said, when it's like, oh, I'm just generally unhappy, or if, you know, like Jeff mentioned, you do a fantastic job with onboarding and training, and you've got a, you know, what everyone else would see as a pu perfect new buffer employee, and then they're unhappy at the end, it's like, uh, I mean, I don't, yeah, it's like you don't really know what else to do at that point. Um, Livingston, you've been, you've been kind of quiet on this one. Um, what do you think? I mean, have you ever... You know what happens when somebody on the jetpack team or whatever is you know unhappy about something? How does that play out? That's a good question. I think that um, at least the teams I've worked on, we've been um, fortunate enough to uh, at least in you know the the public eye, I've not had that happen too much. Um, I think one nice thing about automatic that may curb some of this is um, just the fact that. We do so many different things, and there are opportunities to do, uh, honestly, almost entirely different jobs, but still be within the same company. Um, and you know, things like you know, team switches and rotations and things like that are really encouraged, even. Um, and so I think maybe we, I don't know, maybe we avoid some of this uh, unhappiness by allowing people to essentially get a new job, but still work for automatic. So it's not like actually getting a new job. Um, so, you know, they may be working on Jetpack one day, and then they may go work on, you know, something totally different, uh, CloudUp or something, you know, one of the other products that, um, you know, we've acquired or something like that, and, you know, it may be completely different. Uh, I know some people, you know, now that um, the Wu acquisition has gone through, some people have, um, you know, been doing some, like, happiness rotations, and, like, the way that um, Wu does support is completely different than the way, you know, we have historically done supported automatic so yeah it's essentially a new job but you know still working for automatic nothing really changes there but um, your day-to-day -day is you know uh, vastly or, or wildly different um, and so I think maybe we avoid some of that uh, at automatic a little bit uh, just because of that but like I said I haven't uh, I've been fortunate enough not to, to go through that myself or, or see it played out um, so yeah I don't I don't know for sure how that would play out um, in, in our case Yes, yeah, so just to kind of not put a neat, tidy bow on on all this because I don't think we're going to. Um, what? So, and Jeff, we'll start with you on this one. Since, so, to what extent is it your job to make sure that somebody's happy both at work and at home? Because a lot of times, you know, I've worked for dozens of companies before and, that talk about work-life balance and being happy at work, being happy at life, and especially with you know, customer support people. If you're interacting with customers every day, if somebody, I don't know, if you stub your toe that morning, that's going to ripple into some of the conversations you have with customers. Uh, obviously, you can't fix somebody's stub toe, but I mean, you know what I mean. Uh, how much of it is it your responsibility to make sure that they're happy outside of work versus focusing on if they're happy at work? Uh, that's a tough one. Yeah, um, see, this is the trick. So uh, for those of you that, I'll give you a second to think about that one, uh, and the rest of you start thinking because it's the same thing. We're just going to talk about it for a minute. Um, for If you haven't been on the show, I usually send out like some starter questions and things like that. Those are great, but every now and then I'll throw in one like this, and it like totally catches all of us off guard because I just thought of it like five minutes ago with this conversation. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so it's, it's absolutely a tough question, and you're going to hear some pauses and things as we think through this. So, yeah, Jeff, what do you think? So... Two, two things. Uh, one, so let me just put aside the quick one, which is, yeah. uh, and I think Carolyn would have even better notes on this, which is we try to take really great care of our of people. And so we, I've been, one of the things I've been actually the most proud of is I've hired a ton of people that would, if they were here right now, would tell you they were in pretty lousy physical condition when they joined Wistia. They were unhappy with themselves, unhappy with their health, and they made huge changes 
in that way. Maybe not like adopting a new diet or anything like that, but like mm-hmm. as sim- something as simple as giving up soda or switching um, their afternoon snack choices to something a little bit healthier. And it like I've just you know, like they say in the course, like I just watch the weight melt off people, and it's like really amazing because they seem genuinely happier. Um, and you know, maybe they do like new activities, physical stuff, or whatever. Anyway, um, just being around a bunch of other people who are really excited about that and really into that kind of stuff, and can be a good support group for that. I think, like, just as a general company culture note, we've left a whole bunch of people way better than we found them, even though they're still with Wistia. That's the only sentence I could come up with to describe that. So that's like very core personal stuff, but I'm just going to leave that aside because I think that's like a company culture decision. Um, in terms of as a leader at a company and as in some cases a direct manager, um, the thing that we should never do, the thing that I think drives a lot of people's ego, right, and and this this has a huge effect on their life and in you know interactions outside of work is is it clear to them that the work that they do is important? Are the, like is that work connected, well connected by leaders throughout the company to our our highest mission? And is that done regularly and reinforced regularly? Um, are they able to describe to friends and family why what they do First of all, what they do and why what they do is important. If they're able to do these things, they're starting off. Are they being like fairly compensated for the work that they're doing? Are they able to have that flexible schedule that means that they can continue to take care of stuff in their personal life while getting their work done? Like all, all of those things, some of which are are just core company culture for us. Other ones are like things that a manager really needs to be spending a lot of time doing. It's just revisiting that concept of let's just go back to the beginning. Here's why we provide support, right? Th- that's how we. That's why Wistia exists as a company is because we provided support and Google and YouTube do not, right? And that people who are like, I have no idea how this video stuff works and what I'm supposed to be looking for as a marketer. We built a product that helps you do that, and other platforms don't care. And everything else we put on top of it is amazing, valuable bells and whistles, or at least we hope so. But at a very core sense of like existential why we're here, it's to take care of our customers. And as a support person, if you have any interest in providing support and you hear that, you're reminded of just how important you are. And we and we put our support people very high up in the organization. We get a lot of great feedback from them on everything. They get insight into just about everything. Um, and so we've I don't know, I guess I just feel like we've made a bunch of decisions that reinforce why that stuff is important, and we try to say it frequently, and you're just setting yourself up for happiness at home and at work. When you can go home and you're proud of the work that you did, and you're not, like, working all weekend to scramble to, like, catch up just so you can come home deflated because your manager said you did a, a bad job on a Monday or something, or nobody thinks that the work you did is important. Like, that's what leads to burnout and unhappiness at home and at work. So... Like that's kind of going back to what I was saying before about making sure we're setting people up for success when we write the first job description and when we're interviewing and all the way through to when we're celebrating their their one year anniversary or something like that. So definitely no short answer there. Uh, I hope I left enough time for everybody else to say better things, but that's that's where I would start. I think. Yeah. See, this is what I love about these kind of shows because there's no short answer and there's no like neat tiny bow that we're going to put everything in. Uh, but so Chase, when it comes to automatic, how, you know, what things are they doing to make sure that your, your work and life happiness are, are balanced out or do they even like, does it matter? Is it, you know, Andrew Spittle or any other team leads job to make sure you're happy at home? Um, I think, uh, you know, like our, our team leads definitely care. And even, you know, as far as that goes, our other team members, like, um, you know, all the teams that I've been on and, and folks that I know on other teams, um, they're usually, you know, pretty tight knit and sort of like a, you know, a family within automatic, I guess, because those are the people you're working with every day and that kind of thing. So, I mean, we obviously, um, are always, um, talking about what's going on in our, our personal lives and our home lives. You know, if somebody's kid's sick, we know about it. If, um, somebody, you know, is just having, you know, a, a problem, if, if they're sick, if, 
you know, if there's something going on with their family, we know about it. So I think, you know, as a as a team, not just as, you know, our, our team lead or, or happiness lead or something like that, I think that um, we're all concerned about, you know, each other's well-being and that kind of thing. And so we all try to encourage each other to take time off when we need it. You know, hey, we'll, you know, if you're just not feeling great this afternoon, we'll, you know, keep an eye on your replies and your tickets and stuff like that for you. Go, you know, do something, go take a walk, go hang out with, you know, your family, whatever. So I think, you know, a lot of that is, is taken on by uh, other team members and, and that kind of thing for us. Uh, it's not, you know, the responsibility doesn't fall to, to just one person as a, a team lead or, or something like that. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a, a great way that I found it automatic. We sort of, handle those kinds of, you know, life issues that, that may come up um, and, you know, interfere or, or take priority over, you know, the work that you're doing. All right, Carolyn, have you had plenty of time to think? Are you ready? I, I, I must have been listening. I think that they that both Jeff and Chase said really profound things. <laughs> um, I need to rewatch this part of the show. Um, yeah, so I, I thought that, um, gosh, yeah, I just I agree with everything that's been said. Um, I think the, uh, my understanding of the original question was like, how much of it is happiness at home? How much of it is happiness at work? How much of the responsibility of the company? Yada yada. Um, and I do think that, like all things, like you're you're in a relationship with the people that you are working together with and, and everybody in the team is in a relationship with everybody else in the team you know one person heavily affects everybody else um, and so you know sometimes things are tough at work and that affects things at home very much and um, whether it's tough because you know one customer gave you a bad review right after you had like skipped lunch to help that person like whether it's a little thing or a big thing, like I'm unhappy and I can't figure out why, or I'm unhappy and I, you know, think that it's because what I really care about and want to work on is not valued here and I think I have to change jobs. Like, it can be very small or very big and that gets carried over all the way into home. Um, and that goes the other way too, you know, if, if somebody has a sick kid or you know, a, a thing that lasts and lasts, you know, that carries into work. And I think it's good to sort of be cognizant that when things are really great at work, that probably bleeds into home. When the things are tough at work, that bleeds into home and vice versa. Um, and it's good to, to recognize that, um, you know, it's not always easy. <laughs> um, so, and people are, are, are complicated and lives are complicated and so um, you know all these it's I think it's just really important to have a lot of trust and patience um, in every individual team member and if you're the one going through it with your whole team and your your team lead and that is my job to set up that environment like I can continuously seek to set up a place where it's something that you know, somebody can talk about anything or they can, you know, um, feel hope with this group of people. Um, so, yeah, that's absolutely, completely, very, very much um, my job and our jobs. Um, so, you know, yeah, providing a safe space, obviously. Um, kind of the other thing is that, like, you know, people have flaws, <laughs> right? So, um, and people go through things that are short and long. So, um, you know, somebody stubs their toe some days, and sometimes people have, have really experienced depression. Um, and those are two really different things. Um, and neither of those are flaws. Um, and sometimes it is something that somebody can change, and sometimes it's not. And so I think... Asking, learning how to ask those questions is something that's that I've have so much more left to learn about. But um, is probably the most rewarding part of my job at Buffett for the last three years is trying to separate those things and you know provide a really really valuable and 
helpful and supportive environment for whatever the answer is. Um, and I think that is our job. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, yeah, home, work, it all. It's, it's, it's hard to separate the two. Um, and I think people who say that they can probably do sort of, but um, I don't know that it can be done completely. And I think if you want to expect people to, you know, when they have a tough day at work, to hang in there because things are good at home, I think it's good to go the other way too. Um, and to, when somebody's having a tough time at home, try and help them hang in there by being a really happy work environment and doing all you can to provide that. And there it is. I don't think we can get any better than that. So that's where we'll leave it. Um, let us know how your team's handling this kind of stuff. You know, if you're a team lead, if you're, you know, whether it's a team of two or a team of 200, let us know how you're handling um, unhappy employees, happy employees, and finding out it, which one they are and, and, you know, all that, basically everything we talked about on the show. Um, sorry, I just got a little, a little emotional there from Carolyn. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, yeah, so let us know, supportops.co forward slash contact or hit us up on Twitter. We're at supportops there. Um, yeah, that was, yeah. We're just going to leave it there. Um, all right, that brings us to my favorite part of each and every week with this crew, and finally one that we're all four back for, which is even better. It's this week's shout-outs. These are the things that are making us happy, so happy we want to shout them out from the rooftops and let you know that you should be doing, buying, selling, reading, whatever, this thing. So, um, Jeff, kick us off. What do you got? Uh, so for this week, I am shouting out the Apple Photo Streams product. If anybody uses Apple Photo Streams, they're the best for events um, that I've ever seen. So uh, after our wedding, we went to a uh, the water a cabin on the water in Vermont with that was like about as remote as we could get on a night's notice and. Uh, just sat there and looked through the photo stream that all of our friends had put, had created during the wedding. And it was like all these things that we were not par a part of or privy to because we were whatever getting ready. And just seeing all of those photos and having like conversation between friends about all the things that were going on that we had no idea about was the absolute best. And there are so many... Um, of those like cloud services that Apple just screws up and they're just not the best and there's other people who are way better at it. This is like three clicks. Anyone with an iPhone can use it. They don't need you know special software or apps or anything like that. They don't need to create another login. Um, and it's really easy to push to. Even my mom is in there like posting stuff to a photo stream. So uh, big fan. Awesome, Chase. What do you got for this week? Um, so mine's pretty pretty simple, but I'm just going to shout out uh, Disney World. I was there. My wife and I went with some friends a couple of weeks ago, and um, I think we all know that you know Disney as a company is pretty awesome. Uh, but especially you know their theme parks and all the things that they do, uh, they know how to really craft and and make you have a, a great experience. Um, so yeah, it's it, uh, that was the first time I'd been in quite a number of years, and it was uh, just as awesome as I remembered it when I was a kid. So. Uh, highly, highly suggest them, and um, you know if, if you can find any uh, information or writing on some of the work that they've done. I know they've written some about it, um, some of their employees and things like that. It's it's super interesting how they're able to accomplish that with so many people uh, flooding their theme parks every day. And Carolyn just sitting there shaking her head. So Carolyn, what's your uh, shout out? Yeah, there's a book about that called Be Our Guest. I think about how they do service mm -hmm. that a couple of our team have recommended. Um, I have two links to share. One is, um, or two, two articles. Um, one is on the Huddle blog called How Our Product Team Works. Um, and it's just talking about how, um, you know, there's different areas of, the, of a product and the company that work independently and how all of that works together with communication and, you know, does, does support support the whole thing or are there individual support teams and how do they keep in touch and all that stuff, which is um, we're learning a lot from right now. Um, and the other one is an article called Speed as a Habit um, by, oh gosh, I don't know how to say his last name, the CEO of Upstart, <laughs> Dave G. Um, and uh, 
I've read it several times, and I don't know if I totally agree with everything in it, um, but it's very inspiring to me anyway. Um, and it's some, it's it's just talking about how to really press forward on making a decision more quickly or doing the thing today instead of tomorrow, and um, you know the value of speed over getting everything right. Um, this is very inspiring to me because I tend to be the one at Buffer who wants to go, wait, wait, let's think about this. Um, so I often get dragged along by Joel and Leo and, and the rest. Um, and so I am trying to work on that. And so this article is very influential for me. Um, I still don't know if I'm totally as far as this, um, but I would. It's, it's still a really interesting read. So um, I would love to hear any thoughts of it if anybody reads it. And I'll share it with Chase so that he can put it in the show notes. Awesome. And then for me, um, it's probably, uh, so went on vacation last week, had a seven, eight hour drive, something like that back, and uh, my wife and I listened to a lot of podcasts, and we had exhausted most of the standard ones that we listened to, you know, Radio Lab, um, This American Life, Planet Money, you know, kind of all of our go-to ones, and we still had a lot of time to kill. Um, so we were looking for new ones and stumbled across one called Limetown, uh, limetownstories.com. Uh, it's really cool because it's kind of like a This American Life story, but it's fiction, and it's about a town um, here in Tennessee that uh, basically 300 people disappear from this this little community all at once. Um, so the feeling I get so far, This American Life mixed with like a little bit of X-Files or French maybe, something like that. Um, but it's really cool, really fun. It harkens back to that old like radio story kind of feeling back from the 30s and 40s and it's just, you know, that's I really enjoy that kind of stuff. Um, so check it out. We'll have that and all the rest of those shout outs in the show notes at supportops.co shortly. Um, yeah, we'll be back next week with another great topic probably something not quite as meta as what is happiness and that kind of thing, <laughs> but make sure to join us next week, same time, same place, 5.30 p.m. Central on Monday. And until we see you then, have an awesome week. <laughs>